You're listening to the Observing Eye. Pirate Radio for the Mind. Coming at you fresh from the computer hell cabin. Hello, you beautiful lot. It's Friday, the 20th of October, 2023, and this is episode 35 of The Observing Eye, coming at you live from the computer hell cabin. If you're new, welcome aboard, and if you are returning, welcome back. As always, I like to begin these episodes with a brief moment of reflection, so let's spend a moment thinking about the good things that have happened this week. And now a moment for the not-so-good. In this episode, we're going to be discussing the art of listening, a very important and very powerful skill that all of us can learn, but which is sadly undervalued and underused, in my opinion. I'm going to be explaining what makes a good listener, and I'm going to give you some techniques and tools to improve your listening skills be that at home, at work, with friends, family, colleagues, whatever, we're going to make you a good listener. So when I was studying to be a therapist, psychotherapist, not a, you know, masseuse or anything like that, there's a really big chunk of the course right at the beginning on effective listening. Because, you know, being able to listen to people is a really important part of being a psychotherapist. We're not really much good if we just talk at our clients, kind of defeats the point of anyone coming to us in the first place. So the first thing that they taught us is to investigate what's called a block to listening. Now, there are generally three aspects that we would consider when we talk about blocks to listening. So there are the emotional blocks, and I'll talk a bit more about each of these in detail shortly. So there's the emotional blocks, there's the cognitive blocks, and there are the environmental blocks, which we generally tend to to remove from the picture when we're working in a therapeutic setting. So I'll start with a simple one. So environmental blocks are stuff that's going on around you, right? So maybe you've got someone in front of you and there's a really loud clock, clock, not cock, in the room. There's a very loud cock in this room and your mind is sort of distracted and present by this ticking sound of the clock. So you're not fully focused and fully engaged or listening to the person in front of you. So that's environmental factors, nice and straightforward. And we generally, we can eliminate those from from a therapeutic setting. If you're just like talking to people uh, and you are finding yourself being distracted by environmental factors, then perhaps do what you can to bring your you know, notice it, notice that you are being distracted, use some of those self-awareness tools that we've talked about previously, and bring your mind, your awareness back to the person that is speaking to you. If you can't remove the environmental factor without, you know, totally derailing the conversation, then use your awareness, use your discipline, bring your mind back and focus on the person in front of you. So then we have the cognitive factors that can impede us from being able to listen, that act as a block to listening. So cognitive factors generally are our presuppositions and biases and our want to jump to conclusions, to join the dots far too readily. So if someone is speaking to us and we have a particular bias or prejudice or any kind of like internal stuff going on around the topic of the conversation, then those are going to come to the surface. And what can happen is those prejudices and biases can overlay on top of what the other person is telling us. So we're not really hearing what the other person's saying. We're hearing what we've inferred or interpreted them to be saying based upon our own internal biases. Now, these cognitive uh, blockers are, are trickier, much trickier to deal with than just a noisy clock, for example. So these are, this is where we have to do the work on ourselves. And this is why when we study to become a therapist, we spend a year essentially working on ourselves and trying to iron out our own kinks and, and improve our self-awareness. So we know 
We know the things that are going to come up and we can observe them and be aware of them and we can try to put them to one side when we are engaged and listening to another person. So again, as with all this stuff that we talk about, there is no quick fix. There is no rapid path from A to B. We can't, you know, there's no ticket to get in the fast lane and then we've just got this stuff. It's about persistent, consistent practice and effort and improving our self-awareness. But just to be aware and be to be mindful of those biases and those prejudices that come up, that is, you know, that's 90% of the battle. Once we are uh, once we are aware of something, then we can do something about it to change. If we aren't aware of it, then, you know, we're pretty stuffed, right? So self-awareness is key here. So the other thing that I mentioned there that you probably noticed was the idea of jumping to conclusions. Now, we all do this. We all do this to an extent. And it's kind of part of the way that the brain works anyway. We will, our thoughts will walk the most trodden path. And this happens all the time. It's part of this like autonomous thinking. All right. Now, when someone's talking to us about something and we think we know what they're saying and we think we know what the outcome's going to be, our brain will instantly jump to what we think the outcome is. The problem is that our preconceived outcome may very well not be the actual outcome that the person is going to get to when they are talking to us. And because we've jumped to this conclusion, in comes the biases, you know, the whole like confirmation bias. We we then suddenly overlay everything that the person is talking to us about with our own idea of what we think is happening. We are not detaching and observing and listening to the other person's experience, the other person's words. We are filling in the blanks in our own way with what we think is right. So that is another block to listening under the whole cognitive umbrella. So next I'm going to move on to emotional blockers. Now this one sounds fairly simple, but again, is intrinsically complicated to deal with in the long run. But when someone is speaking to us, and I'm sure all of us have experienced this because I certainly know I have, when someone's speaking to us about something and it triggers a really strong emotional response in us. So maybe someone's talking about uh, a parent, their parents just died. And a few months ago, one of our parents died. So it brings up a lot of emotion, a lot of raw stuff. And that emotion, quite understandably, gets right in the way of us being able to effectively listen to the other person. How we deal with this is a tricky one. So I'm going to give us a, a, nice, a nice example to work with, right? Nothing too heavy. So let's say that we are, we are listening to someone and they keep playing with their hair right? All the time, like throughout the conversation. And for some inexplicable reason, you find that action deeply irritating. So that's your emotional response kicking in. Now, if you imagine it from the other person's point of view, your irritation is going to come out in some way and they may see that as impatience and they will then infer that you aren't listening to them and that they're, you know, they, you're just not interested. You're not engaged with them. And that's going to make them sort of shut down and they're going to close up and they're not going to, they're not going to be as open and authentic with you as they could have been. We'd call this an empathic disconnection. How would we deal then with that irritation that's coming up, that emotional response that's coming up in us? Now, Kel Surprise, we're going to come back to self-awareness again. We're going to have to observe or have the capacity and the ability to observe that this emotion is coming up. And we're going to need to be able to step back from it a little bit and to observe it and recognize that this is not serving us in any sort of positive sense to be able to effectively listen to the other person. Now, as a therapist, we generally have a supervisor and we would take that to our supervisor, who is also a therapist and a more experienced therapist than we are generally. And we go to them and we sort of have our own therapy session. And I'd say, I really found the way that Sandra was messing with her hair in that previous session that I had with her massively irritating and distracting. Like what's going on with that? I want to explore that a bit. And, you know, it's going to end up that it has probably just reminded me of someone 
else who did the same sort of thing when I was younger that I really didn't get on with or who was unpleasant to me in some way or whatever it is. There is some historical thing there that is manifesting itself as me not liking the way that someone just messes with their hair when they're speaking completely innocuously and with no malicious intent to irritate me whatsoever. But that's how it works. Welcome to the human mind. And now, because I understand that my emotional response comes from the fact that this action of playing with their hair reminds me of someone in the past that was unpleasant to me and I don't like to remember them, because I understand that emotion, I'm no longer irritated by the action because I know the root cause of it. And that's the wonderful thing about self-awareness. When we aren't aware of what's causing us essentially suffering to an extent, then that suffering manifests in really weird and peculiar ways. But when we understand the source of the suffering, all of that emotional bias, it just dissipates and everything becomes a lot easier. We're much more able to fully engage with another person. So the more we understand about ourselves, the more we understand about our own sort of issues and things that come up and little weird emotional quirks that all of us have, myself very much included, the better a listener we can be. So if you want to be a really, really good listener, you first got to get to know yourself. So that's blocks to listening. Didn't take too long, did it? You know, we've covered environmental, we've covered emotional, we've, inco- we've uncovered, we've covered cognitive. God damn, I get my words out. What's next? How else do we be a good listener? I'm going to talk a bit now about advice giving. And it's very, very, very easy to fall into this trap, isn't it? Because it's kind of a natural state, is to want to solutionize and to provide advice to other people. So someone comes to us with an issue they're having, and they're explaining it all to us. And our initial reaction is to try to help them to solve the problem that they're having. The thing is that when people come to talk to us about stuff, they don't always want us to solve their problem. They just want to talk about it. And us giving advice and us trying to solutionize their issue is not us being an effective listener. And what we've also got to remember is that the advice that we're giving the person might seem like good advice from our perspective, but it might be really shitty advice for the person in the context of their own existence and experience. You know, what works for us doesn't work for everybody else. So it's important to recognize that, you know, although we feel, you know, we we are coming at it from a good place, we are trying to help, we feel like we're trying to help, but if you want to be a good listener, you can't be giving people advice, you just have to listen. Those are some ideas there then on how we can work on ourselves and our own responses in order to become a more effective listener. But it's not just about our internal responses, there's also the we have to be showing, we have to show to the other person that we are engaged, we are interested, and that we are listening to them, that they have our full and undivided attention. Clearly then, I don't feel like I should need to say it, but I'm going to say it. Don't play with your fucking phone. You know, you know what I'm saying. That is not the time. If your phone buzzes, don't answer it. Just, just mute it. Put it back in your pocket. Easily done. Okay, first thing. So don't allow, try not to be distracted by stuff. Don't, or appear like very visibly distracted. So eye contact. Eye contact is cool. People like eye contact. It shows that you're engaged. Not like creepy serial killer eye contact, but just look at the person that's speaking to you. And like, don't be all like looking around the room, looking at other stuff that's going on behind them. Don't be like looking at stuff in your hands or playing with things. You gotta, you gotta engage. You gotta physically, visibly be present with that person, and they have to feel that you're present with them as well. That's step one: being present, being visibly present. The next thing that we can do to show that we've understood. So this is about creating empathy. This is a little step, a little step deeper into the art of listening. A little bit more. This is like level two stuff. So don't worry if you can't get this yet, but I'm going to put it out there so that you, you know, you know about it and you can, you can try it, try it out when you feel ready. So paraphrasing, 
This is a technique we use in, in psychotherapy, which is where someone will talk to us for a few minutes about what's going on and they'll explain how they're feeling, their situation. And what we do is we we repeat back to them a, a brief synopsis, like a sentence or so, of what they've said to us and what we've understood that they've said. And that's what we call paraphrasing, okay? So an example could be, you're a, so imagine that you're a, you're a psychotherapist and you've got a client sitting in front of you and a client says to you, I've got this really, really tr- tricky boss and like one minute they're really happy with the stuff that I do, the next minute they're berating me in front of everybody. I just don't know, I don't know how to, how to sort of keep them happy. Like one minute they're like this, the next minute they're like that. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And as a therapist, you, you take that all in, you digest it, and then you would paraphrase to show that you've understood what they're saying. So you're kind of like, you're sort of, you're absorbing it, you're, you're understanding it and you're regurgitating it back at them. You know, not like Jeff Goldblum in the fly, not like that sort of regurgitating, but you know, you're, you're showing that you've understood. And by showing that you've understood, you've built empathy. So as a paraphrase for that, I could say, sounds like you feel that he's not being very consistent. Nice and simple, right? But again, it's not something that you're going to pick up quick, but it's worth practicing. It's a really, really useful skill to like create empathy between you and another person. And the more empathy that you've got with another person, the more they're going to be authentic and honest and open with you. So the better and richer conversations that you're going to be able to have with that person. Fundamentally, the art of listening is about trust. And that's what you're building when you show that you understand another human being. So what have we covered so far then? We've talked about blocks to listening, be that environmental, emotional, and cognitive. We've talked about how you have to be engaged, visibly listening to that other person. And we've discussed the useful tool of paraphrasing. In fact, I've just done a little bit of paraphrasing right now. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover, and I don't want to give you too much because I don't want to overload you all with, you know, information. I'm just going to talk about body language very quickly. That is, body language is an incredibly useful signaler as to what's going on with that person internally. I'm sure that we all know, you know, the standard ones. Like if somebody folds their arms and leans back, it means, you know, they're kind of defensive and don't necessarily want to speak. If their arms are down by their side, they're sort of, their posture's open. It shows that they're more trusting and willing to, you know, willing to talk. So we sort of, we know these, we know these sort of cues. I think intuitively we know these cues. But it's really important to bear in mind and to consider your own body language when you are listening to somebody else. If somebody's speaking to you and you're leaned back in a chair with your arms folded, that signals to them that your defences are up and you're not open to listening to them. So the one thing I would say, when you are listening to someone, just try and be relaxed, sit back comfortably in the chair, try and open up your posture a bit, so arms down by the side or just sort of, you know, on your lap or something like that. And just look relaxed, look comfortable. Because if you look comfortable, then the other person is going to feel comfortable talking to you. Go and have a look at some therapists. You know, just go, I'm sure there's like a zoo. You can go to the therapist zoo and look at them through the bars. Uh, But just go and, yeah, just observe. See how a therapist sits. And you'll know, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's that just relaxed, open demeanor. They are open to the other person speaking to them. So that's the last thing I'll say. Just be mindful of your, of your posture and your body language and what you're signaling inadvertently and generally subconsciously to the other person through your body language. And that, everybody, is all I have to say on the art of listening. Really hope that that's been useful to you. If you've got any questions or you want to throw some ideas into the mix or you want some advice and some, you know, a bit more information about some of the stuff that I've talked about today, then please get onto the Substack, which is theobservingeye.substack.com. And there, this is where the podcast is hosted. On there, you can leave comments under the podcast. So jump on there drop me some comments, or you can message me on, I'm on Instagram, The Observing Eye. I'm on TikTok, The Observing Eye. 
and Facebook, The Observing Eye. So go and find me on whatever social platform you prefer to use and ask me questions because I am always open to talk to people that have listened to this and want to come back and learn a bit more or just discuss stuff. I love it. It's great. Love a bit of discourse. Discourse is great. It's how we learn. Best way to learn. It is Friday today, isn't it? Oh my God. Yes, it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. It's been a week. Feels like it's been a real week this week um, in a really good way. Just, just a lot going on, a lot going on. I'm going to reveal some things in a, in a few episodes time, hopefully. Uh, there is a lot going on, but there is some interesting stuff in the mix that I will reveal later. So keep your ears peeled for that. But yeah, want to wish you all a wonderful weekend. I hope it's restful and regenerating and you've managed to get some time to look after yourselves and enjoy with the people that are important to you. Much love, everybody. I'll catch you soon. You've been listening to The Observing Eye. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I hope that you found it useful. And if you're interested in any more of my writings or work around psychology and philosophy and general day-to-day living, please go and take a look at my substack, which is The Observing Eye dot substack dot com and that's i as in the letter not i as in each latinous organ through which you see take care everybody much love and i'll see you soon